The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Some in the crowd who heard these words of Jesus said, This is truly the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But others said, The Christ will not come from Galilee, will he? Does not Scripture say that the Christ will be of David's family and come from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them even wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. So the guards went to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why did you not bring him? The guards answered, Never before has anyone spoken like this man. So the Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, one of their members who had come to him earlier, said to them, Does our law condemn a man before it first hears him and finds out what he is doing. They answered and said to him, You are not from Galilee also, are you? Look and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Then each went to his own house. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Jeremiah was one of the greatest of the Israelite prophets, and he was also a witness to those terrifying events of 587 BC. Now remember, it was in the year 587 BC that the armies of Babylon invaded the lands of the Israelites and they laid everything waste. The kingdom of David was brought to a shattering conclusion, and the losses were catastrophic. The temple was desecrated and destroyed, the city of Jerusalem was ransacked and burned to the ground, and the Israelites themselves were killed, scattered, exiled, and enslaved. It seemed to be the end of the Israelites and the end of their God. Jeremiah had warned the Israelites repeatedly of this coming catastrophe, but the people refused to listen. They found his insistence on conversion and repentance to be strident and hard to take. Yet Jeremiah testified over and over again that it was only in a radical turning back to God that would save the Israelites. So what did the Israelites do? Well, many just simply pursued a strategy of status quo. We can leverage our wealth. We can engage the machinations of power to hold off and placate the Babylonians. Jeremiah begged again and again, turn away from yourselves and turn towards God for help. But that was not the message the people wanted to hear. It's interesting that the book of the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah is the origin of the word Jeremiah. And that word means a, an harangue or persistent mournful complaint. A Jeremiah is something we don't want to listen to, even if what is being expressed is true. And yet, if you read the book of the prophet Jeremiah carefully, you'll see it's not just a harangue or a complaint. It's a persistent reminder to the Israelites that God wants to save his people. He wants to save them from the consequences of their actions if only they would let him but they would not. And what followed from their refusal was a disaster. Jeremiah would come to understand that the Israelites would have to bear the consequences of their refusal of God, but that God would not abandon his people. The dark exile that they would experience, the terrible losses, the humiliations, would become the occasion for transformation and renewal. Through this dark passage, they would learn what was truly valuable in life. 
their wealth would be taken, no more pleasure, no more power, no more honors, but they would learn anew through that deprivation the true value of faith and hope and love. And further and most importantly, they would grow in their understanding and relationship with God. They would learn that his commandments were not just rules and regulations, but a way of life that provided meaning and purpose, a meaning and purpose that the world could not give, only God could give. And all this takes us to the gospel. God comes into this world in Christ Jesus. And the great mystery of that revelation is that he comes as our savior, as our redeemer. Those designations indicate that his mission is a rescue mission. And we need to be rescued. Think about that, Christians. Our refusals of God trap us. They trap us in predicaments that we cannot extricate ourselves from. Or they exact a price and consequences that's so high that the cost is something that we could never pay. We do this to ourselves. And therefore, we don't deserve God's intervention. But God does intervene. Not because we deserve his help, but because he loves us. All this reaches its startling culmination in the cross, where we see for ourselves the greatest refusal of God possible. And that refusal deserves nothing but wrath. But that's not what happens. God meets us in the cross not with our destruction, but with his offer of mercy. And it is in that mercy that we see the profound depth of God's love for us and his absolute passion to resist all our refusals of his repeated overtures of grace. Lent and Holy Week are meant to bring all of this into clear and sharp focus. Because, brothers and sisters, if we better understand who God is and what his mission is, we will better understand who we are and what our mission is all about.